being here. My name is Betsy Cohen. I'm a professor in the School of International Service, and I'm also a, the SIS faculty coordinator for teaching and student learning, and a CTRL faculty fellow. I've been teaching at AU since 2006, and teaching in general since 1995. All right, I'm Sherry Patillo. I am Associate Director of International Student Development in Kogat School of Business. Previously, I worked in Academic Support and Access Center for about 10 years, working with international students, also with students with disabilities, and also non-traditional students. And uh, I've been affiliated with AU for uh, quite some time. I got my master's degree here in teaching English to speakers of other languages, taught here for a few years, starting in 2004, and then actually I just passed my 11 year anniversary a couple of days ago. Congratulations. So we uh, will not in have everybody introduce themselves. I usually would do that, but in a group this large, we're not going to. Because also, the for me, in everything that we discussed today, I want you to think about why you would do any of this, or what, what works for you. I like to say in all the teaching workshops that I do from the outset is, uh, you cannot be me. I tried to do that when I first started teaching as a graduate student. I tried to be Nick Ono. It was a disaster. Uh, he was a fantastic teacher. It's not the way I teach, and I could teach. I can't be Nick. So you have to be you, and not me or Sherry. So whatever works for you. And in a case of introductions, we're not going to be together as a group. So the question would be, what would be the purpose of it? So I always think about that. I, when I do teaching workshops, I try to sort of do this metacognition thing going on at the same time. So uh, it's just a plug to you as you think about your introductions for your classes that are going to meet next week, which is what would be the purpose of those introductions. Okay. I want to thank everyone who submitted syllabus language to um, the, the website. We had uh, almost 30 people participate, and so I appreciate you sharing. and. Um, also appreciate, so for some people, their bravery in sharing, so really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. And we, it is there as a document for you to you go through and look and think, oh, that's a great idea, or oh, that makes me think such and such, and so we're not going to go through that, langu that language, but it is there for all of us to look at and figure out what we want to do with it. So what we're going to do, the first thing I want to do, this is another teaching thing. So I'm going to tell you what the agenda is, what our objectives for today are. Why am I doing that? Because it's good teaching practice, but also at the end of this, you're going to evaluate us based on whether we met, when we laid out the learning objectives and whether uh, we met them. So this is another teaching tip for you, especially when you do your teaching evaluations at the end of the semester. Go through your syllabus. At the, in that last class period and say to the students, this is what we try, have them take out the syllabus, this is what we plan to do, this is what we did. Now, I'm leaving the room for 20 minutes, you fill out the teaching evaluations. It, faculty tell me it improves their evaluations. So, our goal for the day is, uh, I'm gonna, uh, Sherry and I are gonna start out by talking about why were we thinking this whole idea of class participation. And then we're going to brainstorm what counts as participation. And you might have noticed I asked you to think about that in an email I sent based on the reading that I gave, that we gave you, which was the 28 syllabi language um, from you all. And then we're going to talk about strategies for inclusive participation. Knowing how much we had to think about, I spent the time this week and wrote a handout for you all so that I didn't have to lecture on it. It's another thing I'm doing more and more in my classes which is when I have information that I need to share, can I put it on a handout and give it to people so that we can use our time to then actually discuss things? Because you can read things much faster than uh, I can say them. So that section will really just be about you reading and then we're talking about questions. We want to leave time for personal reflection, where you're actually going to sit here and try and either toodle, you know, tweak your uh, language for your syllabus on uh, class participation, or play with some notes and think about what you want to incorporate. And then finally, how we can communicate those expectations to our students. And I'll dispense with that one right away because we have so much to do. Uh, I, uh, on the handout I gave you, it's the last thing, five things that you might want to do to consider to express those uh, expectations to your students. 
So, in the spirit of modeling things that we think that you might like to see and use in your classroom, we're going to have a brainstorming activity. Wait, but first, let's talk about why we're thinking. Oh, yeah, let's do that. I'm too anxious. No, you're too, too excited. excited. You're doing good. <laughs> so, um, for me, uh, with my background in working in academic support for so many years, working with international students, speakers of other languages, class participation has always been uh, an ongoing uh, issue, a concern for students and also a concern for faculty. And there are a lot of things to consider now as the university is becoming more diverse. And some of these things are, of course, students who are from other places, minority students, students of differing ethnicities, first generation students, academic readiness of students, students from traditionally un underserved populations, socioeconomic issues, religion, gender, sexual orientation, language, probably more that I haven't mentioned. All of these students are now in our classes, and we want to be able to include everyone and not, uh, not, not have students feel like they are separate from whatever the conversation is. So I used to do a uh, workshop on classroom participation and work with students over a period of several weeks, particularly for non-native English speakers, talking about what are some different ways that you can get into the class discussion and some different ways that you can participate in class. And I'm happy to talk to you about that some other time on an individual level. Can you tell us a little about universal design? Sure. You have actually uh, in your handouts that are online a uh, handout about universal design uh, learning guidelines. Does anyone know what universal design is? A few people, right? The idea is that it can be accessible to anyone. Right. So, so learning principles that allow learning to be accessible to everyone. We can all think of, uh, for instance, uh, a curb cut is a wonderful example of universal design, right? Instead of having a big step like this to get up on the curb, of course, now they have cutouts in the sidewalk so someone can easily get onto the sidewalk from the road. That helps everyone, not just people in wheelchairs. It helps mothers with strollers. It helps uh, people with bicycles. It helps me because my knee's hurting today. So that is a, that's a good example of universal design in general. Universal design regarding learning has to do with what strategies and what techniques can we use in the classroom to provide that same access. For instance, with international students, it's a great practice for me to be maybe talking, but also having some text on the board so that they can read along. Um, Having uh, text also helps a student who maybe doesn't process very well auditorily, but maybe processes more visually. Anyway, just a couple of examples. And those are examples actually where the student can then more fully participate. Uh, and so we have to start rethinking that uh, participation, not just as people speaking in class, but what can I do to help them be fully engaged in my classroom? Right. So that's the. So that's what I want to talk about why I'm rethinking classroom participation. Okay, I'm an extrovert, in case you haven't figured that out. I'm, I'm not. Sorry. <laughs> Don't apologize. Don't apologize. I'm going to apologize for talking over you because I'm an extrovert. All right, so I'm an extrovert, and I love to be up there in the, class, in the front of a room, and I love to speak. And I, I like process information by talking out loud, right? Not everybody does that. And as Sylvia has pointed out at the plenary, that we now have students who are suffering from social anxiety. We have four, the, her, her, art, her article in Foreign Affairs from last fall, and I recommend it to you, talks about almost 40% of college-age students, college-age people, are suffering from anxiety and depression. So uh, I'm like, OK, what does that mean for me as a teacher? And in the past, my view, so my view about teaching is I, I believe in democracy, and that means everybody is able to, uh, should participate, right? We, if, otherwise, our democracy is going to suffer because some are going to take control over uh, those uh, levers of power. And so I've always talked about the classroom as a way to help young people learn how to participate and engage 
at, a, at a, a local, you know, really minuscule level for the greater purpose of democracy. And that means everybody needs to learn how to speak in class. Everybody needs to engage, and that's all part of our learning community, and that we need to be accountable to each other, and that we are responsible to each other. And that's really um, how I'm going to evaluate you based on your uh, participation in class. I also have um, understood for a while now that not everyone is like me. <laughs> and that there's some people who are more reluctant to speak in a classroom. And so I have also developed techniques or uh, means so that other measures count as participation. So I'll have students do an in-class writing assignment. And that in-class writing assignment is only based on a reading question that, is only that I give them in advance. So again, it's to democratize the classroom, which is everybody has the ability to do their reading and take notes on it. And they can even use their notes in these in-class writing assignments. It's not to quiz them. It's about to have them engage in the course material and come to class prepared. And so that is data for their class participation. But in the last year, I have experienced students who have so much social anxiety that they, I had a, literally had a student in my office during office hours crying at the beginning of the semester to tell me she is not able to speak in class. And then I had another student say to me that I will not speak unless I know that I am 100% correct because I don't want to be called stupid by my peers because I'm a perfectionist. And I had another student say to me, if I know that I'm going to be called on in class, I stop listening because I'm working up the courage to figure out what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it in the classroom. And I thought, oh my god, if I'm going to require them to speak, I'm impeding their education. I'm impeding their learning. So I need to rethink this. And I, um, and I will tell you, I'll be honest, I feel caught right now. Because I still believe in everything I said to you initially about the importance of being able to speak in groups and do it in a safe environment and do it and that's where the classroom is a place for learning. But just as I would not ask someone who has a broken leg to go out, you know, go on, what do you mean you're not going to go run the mile? Come on, we're all going running right now. I don't think it's fair for me to ask a student who suffers from anxiety and depression to get up there and go on, just speak in front of, you know, 19 people. Go, go ahead and speak in 25 people. You can do it. That, to me, is the same thing as asking that person with a broken leg to run. So that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm puzzling over this. And I look for your insight to help me and others uh, move forward with this. I think that one thing that... So, oh, yeah, so let's take a few comments real fast. Sure. Um, I don't know that the microphone's needed. Thank you. First of all, thanks for the opportunity to provide feedback during the discussion, and also thanks for holding this session. Um, to your last point uh, about helping with insights, um, I teach also at a different university um, as an adjunct professor, as I am here, and two years in a row I've had students who have found the courage after a few weeks of weekly or monthly classes to tell me that they have anxiety or depression and they're relieved to hear that they're not weird and there are lots of other people out there and I understand and I'm gonna give them some space. And then I also tell them when I was a university student, as an undergrad, these are grad students, I had a bout of depression and it really saved my life to have at least one professor know that that's what I was going through. Drawing on that ages ago experience with depression as an undergrad, I can tell you that the professor who really saved my life tried to get me to talk a little bit in class, but very gently, and just like you are now, came close to me, of course you brought me the mic, but you know, offered physical support without touching, and was very kind about it, and I never had to say a word to him about what was going through my head, he could see it, and he really helped give me a bit of my confidence back. Thank you. One thing that I was going to mention is that um, I, I do talk to a lot of faculty and they say, well, I've got a lot of content, you know, I've got a lot of content to share, 
Uh, I'm expecting students to come in and already have these skills, but the fact is that in today's reality, you know, are we teaching content or are we teaching skills? And the answer is yes, because a lot of students are coming in not necessarily having the same skills, academic skills, classroom skills, as, uh, as we maybe have seen in the past and in this culture. And I also want to add so that, don't, that we don't just uh, spend only our time only on the social anxiety or internet social, there's also hierarchies of power, right? Mm -hmm. And that we understand that, uh, I don't think I need to say that it's usually, not always, but it's students who are white and male who dominate in classroom discussion. And so are we, and, and for extroverts, and so are we going to continue those uh, hierarchies and, uh, or what can we do to stop that? And uh, I would also, again, like to add that I like to problematize the extrovert and in, uh, in terms of class participation and say, what can we do to quiet the extrovert to give the other students, for whatever reason, the space so that they can participate, so that they can speak up, if they so desire. Any other comments or questions so far? Hi, I'm sort of related to the idea of in-class writing assignments that, um, I was wondering what you thought of the idea of having, so to speak, discussions on Blackboard also count as class participation. Someone posts a question, people answer the question or post responses, but other people said. Uh, we will pay you later. Right. The, the next item is a brainstorm of what counts as class participation. Excellent segue. She really wasn't a plan. So, <laughs> so, Felicia. Thank you, Mom. Yeah, so about um, quieting the extrovert. So this past semester I gave a group assignment. So it was like a, a debate, a critical issues and justice course. And so they did debates. Um, each way. And so after the debate, obviously that's a verbal thing, right? You have to get up, that group work, get up. And then after the debate would go, I actually created um, a survey for the group to give, so they could give me essentially assess group dynamics. And what happened was, which I didn't intend for it to happen, but it was a way actually kind of silence the extroverts because they knew that their peers were going to give feedback. So it I didn't intend for it to happen, but it ended up kind of, they regulated themselves in a way that I didn't anticipate that actually forced them to pass the, um, at least within those discussions, to pass um, the opportunities around. That, re that really helped a lot. That's a great idea. I also want to then, I will put in a plug now for my ticket out the door, which is one of the things I do with my first year students. The handout is, uh, the forms is in Word so that you can use it. It's on our site. And uh, what I do is I ask the students to self-evaluate at the end of every class. Uh, just initially, because it does take time. But the, the form is, based on the participation rubric for this course, what participation grade would you give yourself for today's class? And why? And uh, the rubric which I use, so now I have to talk about that, which is also online. It comes from Vanilla, Villanova University. Listening, preparation, quality of contributions, impact on seminar, and last, it says frequency of participation, and it says at appropriate times. And I tell the students that if you participate too much, it can lead to a negative, uh, a low participation rate. So the point of doing this is, what I realized is, I started to do this because I realized our students don't know what is good participation. And I noticed that from quite a few of the syllabi, which is it's not really spelled out. And even in, on mine, I was like, wait a minute, I need to spell this out even more than just the rubric. And I came up with an idea this morning. I should, I, sh I should share it, but I'm so excited. I'm going to have students uh, I'm going to periodically ask them to hand in their notes from class. And that's going to be towards their participation grade. Because not only do, it's going to teach them, it's going to be formative and summative. It's going to teach them how to take notes in class. And it's also going to show how engaged they were with whatever was going on in the classroom. I don't know, I'll tell you how it works out. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, let, I'll call you in one second, which is to say that the ticket out the door also says, what still puzzles you about the material you covered in class today? Nothing is, po is a possible answer. Or what one insight did you have today? Or any other comments? And so I, it's, there, I, make, I do two to a sheet, but I cut it and I print it back to back to save paper. You can do it electronically, I'm sure. But I, like, I actually think there's something about the paper. So it is amazing to me how the students learn like, to self-regulate. And to also, they know that they're going to be evaluated, so they actually engage. And the student who doesn't want to say anything in class, they, if what they put on the piece of paper counts towards their participation grade. If they are engaged with the material, make some insightful comment, I'm sorry, it's only between them and me, but it counts towards participation. Oh, I was just going to say that I have a colleague who does that with students who are sort of reluctant to, to speak out loud in class. Is you just have them open an email to him during the class and type in their notes as if they're kind of like live tweeting the discussion. And then and it works really well for him. I haven't done it yet, but it's certainly something that I'm looking forward to trying. Okay. Also, it gives you the opportunity to, um, if you see something interesting in the students' notes, to ask them mm -hmm. about it in class next time. I think, did you want to say? Um, are you planning on telling them when you're collecting the notes, or is it like a fun surprise <laughs> at the end? I haven't thought about that. What, should, what do you think? I don't know, because if it's a surprise, that does like incentivize them to like take notes every class, but also that could be really stressful, so I'm not really sure. I don't know. I did do an exercise. This is a, uh, it's a tangent, but I did just once, with, and it didn't really work, sort of. Uh, which is I had the students, you know how some, do you ever, like, the next class you review what, we, what you discussed last class? Does anyone ever do that? So I had the students do that, but I called their names out of a hat. Oh. And they didn't know that they were going to be called on to, it was called uh, review and report, R&R. &R. You have to name everything you do, just name it, and then they're like, oh, I'm, I'm good with that. Just name it. So it was called R&R, &R, and a student, I pulled their name out of the hat, and they had to review and report um, and I gave them a few minutes to get their uh, report together, at, but only at that beginning of the class. So it would be, okay, oh, Diane, Diane, you're up today. Uh, you have a few minutes while I do this introductory stuff. I want you to review and report the top three takeaways from last class. Because I was like, does anyone ever like, remember? What, was anybody listening to me? Right? So what do you think? Should I tell them in advance? Potentially what it's going to be is they're not necessarily taking notes in class, but they prepare notes ahead of time. But I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing, right? Because, you know, they're participating in various ways. Like even doing the reading, it's, it's, it's part of the grade, it's also part of the education. Right? It's very like, holistic. So you just mentioned something else, which is notes on the reading. That's different than notes on, I just want their notes from that class. So. One thing I was going to jump in and say, though, about the surprise, personally, I find the surprises in general overrated, personally. Uh, but one thing to always consider if you're planning to surprise students with something like collecting notes or having a pop quiz, um, you know, anything like that. Sometimes there are students, uh, either because of language, maybe because of a disability, do actually require, and some are actually are entitled to, extra time to prepare. So it's just something to consider. When you're considering a surprise, how can I still make this a surprise, but also have everybody be able to um, be accessible? Yeah, I would suggest perhaps at the end of the class, um, to which they'd be reviewing, announcing who would be um, presenting their notes so that way they can prepare and won't know in advance of that particular class. Because I know um, back in grad school with Socratic Method, if, uh, if folks knew what to read or, or when they'd be called on, they would just make sure they read, uh, and, you know, thoroughly uh, before that particular class. But I think if, if you're not sure when you'd be up, but if you find out at the end of that class, I think folks would take good notes throughout. I think that's a great idea. So we were going to do the brainstorming. On the what else, brain. right? So take what I share. So this is obviously something that you can do in your class. Anybody not familiar with brainstorming? 
You don't have to answer that. That is a question that excludes people, right? So brainstorming is a technique that you can use to generate ideas, right? One of the main rules is that it's kind of a judgment-free zone. So any idea that, that someone has is collected. I put several articles about brainstorming on the website, some of them pro-brainstorming, some of them against brainstorming. You can check those out on your own. But that's what we're going to do here today. The question is, what counts as participation? What can count as participation? And if you don't mind just kind of hollering it out, as we would say where I'm from, I'll just I'll, I'll start writing things down. Taking notes. OK. Asking questions. Sorry, what was it about feedback? Uh, providing feedback. Okay. Thank you. Listening. What counts as communication? Posting relevant news articles on Blackboard. Okay. Mm -hmm. Attendance. Attendance, great. Office hours? Office hours. Presenting, thank you. Journaling. Journaling. On topic side conversations. <laughs> on topic side conversations. Is that happening right now, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Others. Helping other students. Help, helping other helping students. Other students. Building off of that, if, if a student sends around, like, here's a great article about what we're studying, or here's a great event that people might want to go to, I think that's a great way to participate. Okay. Is that happening within class, or is that... No, it might happen during the week. Okay. All right. Right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's 
fun if you have never used it before. Quiz it. And if other students um, like preparing for an exam, makes exam notes for other people. Okay. Submitting your reading notes or showing your professor the reading notes before class. Your notes on the reading. Yeah. Do people really do that? Yeah. I'll, They're going I'll, to now. Do people really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. She said, Do people really do that? They're going to now. It was a suggestion one of my students gave me last semester. I interviewed one of my students who was terrified to speak in class, and I said, give me some alternatives, and she said, um, well, I take notes on the readings every class. I come prepared, like your rubric says. I said, how do I know that? How do you demonstrate that for me? And she said, well, I can show you my notes before mm -hmm. class. I'm sorry, I violated brainstorming. Okay. I'm bad, okay? I, I apologize. It, we need the whole list up there first before we have crosstalk. Hold that thought. Yeah. Hold the thought. <laughs> My bad. Sherry, anything else we want to add to the list? Yes. Maybe correcting uh, an inaccuracy uh, that you may have sent to the okay. I mean, offline, of course. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> or not. Don't talk. Don't talk. <laughs> In-class writing assignments, do we have that up there? I don't think so. Short, low-value assignments. stop because we've run out of room. Burning desires. I hope you were writing the Mark? things that are being said. What about if sharing the fact that they shared something they learned in your class in another yeah. class? Like, oh, I was writing this, this paper for my feminist theory class and I decided to write it on religion. Intersection of feminist theory, showing that they were actually applying the thing you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, interdisciplinary uh, using material in another class. Your material in another class. All right. So, is there anything for those who did do the homework and <clears throat> saw what other people had written on their? Um, Syllabus language. Is there anything that's missing? No, in terms of any kind of, I'm sorry, any kind of uh, activities that you would count towards class participation. Is, 
Now, with the brainstorming, there always the question is then what do you do with that information? You had a point, did you remember? Right. It was a question. Okay. Well, uh, um, it's about, I guess, grading some of these uh, things. And so it came up for me um, in relation to the question about uh, submitting notebooks and things like that. And so I often have my students you know, respond to questions on Blackboard, the primary purpose of which I would say is twofold. One is to give an opportunity for students who don't want to speak in class to participate you know, via written participation, but the other being just to make sure that they did the reading. And a constant question on my mind always is how to grade those, because if I'm grading them on it, I want to give them feedback at some point. But I did at one point try to give them check, check plus, or check minus on every response post, and that was tedious and not helpful for anyone. Right. So this is what I was just going to say, which is we have to be realistic. And so a lot of fact, about our time, we have to think about whether the purpose of it is formative, which is to help them improve their work, or summative, to uh, give them a grade. So, so do you have an answer for this? Uh, I have an in between question. <laughs> All right, so I, my answer to you is you're absolutely correct, which is you have to be realistic. And what I would suggest is that you decide to give feedback on a couple of them or a couple of times the, per, the semester, and that anyone who wants more feedback would have to come see you in, in their, during office hours. And that, uh, but you have to, to me, the most important thing is you want the students to come along with you for the ride, so to be transparent about why you're doing this. Why are you doing the assignment to begin with? It's about engagement with the material, um, make it realistic, and so you see that it's a multi-step process, whatever it is for you, that's what I tell my students. And it can't be busy work, it has to be for a reason. That they're doing, uh -oh. that, doing that assignment so that they can use that information so that they can work it into the midterm, the final, or a paper. If you are scaffolding it, if you are working that information so that they are doing little bites and then it eventually gets them towards the bigger uh, meal, they'll be fine. If they feel like it's busy work, they'll, they'll rebel. And you'll hate it too. And, and yeah, so that's my, um, that would be my answer. But I do... I do the plus, uh, check plus, check, check minus, minus, or zero. And I use it, that I brought in the, I mean, I just here have, um, that's for one of my classes of 25 students. And I do, uh, I have it uh, seven times, you know, seven different times. So that gives me data on a written assignment that I can use towards their participation grade. So, the student who spoke, had not, never spoke in class and gets all pluses can still get an A for participation because they've engaged the material in written science. Do you have a comment Somebody, in the back? Oh, yeah. Comment yeah. in the back? Mike? Um, is it thick? So a lot of the examples that ended up on the brainstorming board are not at all what I would think of as participation. Yay. Thank you. And that leads me to believe that different people in the room have very different ideas about what the function of a participation measure is. Yes. Thank you. So I was hoping we might talk a little bit about why we're doing this at all and what the different reasons might be. Also not a plant. So we don't, this, when we th started talking about this workshop, it, it turned into so many different things uh, about, for example, how do you assess the participation, but also then it, it, what mattered, what, it depends on what your definition of participation is and why are you doing it. And that depends on your curriculum, it depends on your philosophy of education, it depends on your, uh, your approach to you know, education, and also your time constraints. Um, what role do you see, it can depend on what role you see yourself as a, you know, what role you have as a professor. And I talked a little bit about mine. That's why I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time, that we are not going to ever agree on this. Should 
nonverbal cues and, and nodding of head count? Well, my student who was an A student who was terrified to speak, she said, but you can see I'm looking at the person who's speaking and I'm nodding my head. So I'm listening and that counts as participation. And it gets back to that question also of am I teaching content, am I teaching skills, am I teaching both, and what is the purpose, why am I asking students to participate? Yeah, so for, for a great example, in my mind, that example that we just gave would exactly not be participation. So that is exactly being an audience member, not a participant. That's but, fine, right? But the question is, what's the function of it, and what of measuring it? There might be a function for which being an engaged audience member was something to measure and grade. Everyone has to come up with that answer themselves. Yes. Mark? Yeah, I was going to say, um, in my class, there is not enough time for everyone to participate in this way. That is what I've been actually sharing. So I judge participation a lot by what you were describing. That is, if I can tell that the students are in some way engaged, that's them participating in the work. It's not necessarily the talking, because even if I wanted them to, there's not enough time for them to participate in it, sort of like sharing comments, having those kind of, it's very lecture heavy. So, right. so I think for me, it's the participation is the, is the, it pushes you over the cusp. You got a B plus and I know you participate. That can so that's the fudge over. factor. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I think that there are still hierarchies of power and Western ways of looking at things that we need to be careful of. And that's why I started I had a student who doodled yeah. through class. Yeah. And she said, that focuses my mind. Yeah. I can't, I can't get in her mind. Right. So you, I think if you're going to do, if you're going to use nonverbal forms of communication, you need to ask your students individually, privately, quite, you know, on, on what are your, you know, how do, how do you exhibit engagement? See, for me, I'm, I'm using the word engagement now. I want them to engage with the material, engage with the class. Okay, so I was going to say also, there are other, like, if people show up to review sessions, that shows that there is an interest in, beyond the, you know, beyond simply listening and... No, it shows that they feel they need some help with the material. Right. But that's, I that's could that's be fully engaged, though. but I yeah. learn differently. Right. I don't learn in groups. I, I learn not. by myself. Yeah. And so it, that's what I'm asking us to be really careful of not using our own ways of learning to oppose that on how other people learn. Right. I, I guess what I'm saying is, for me, I use both the quizzes online, the in-class stuff. But it's, it's, it's a, at some point over the course of the semester, a student should be able to demonstrate that they are engaged with the material in multiple ways, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And so, we do that usually through our exams and our papers that they're engaged with the material and that they are learning it. So yet we, we put value on this thing called participation. And some people I noticed in the syllabus language we asked for, they said I give 0%. But, and yet some people said 20%. And I would caution against putting that high value on it. And I, years ago, 2011, I did a workshop at Ann Farron on a particip it was called uh, Grading Participation, Developing a Rubric, Not an Impression. Because let's face it, what do we do? We get an impression about a student, and we like the way they engage with us, and then we give them an A. If that's the way we engage, we like the way they engage with us. <laughs> Correct. Right. And that's why I am really trying to, so one of the reasons we wanted to spend time on what counts as participation is I would like us to think about broadening our idea of what counts as participation beyond speaking in class. Um, Hello. I'm, I don't know if I've ever spoken on a microphone before. I'm Amber. I work in alumni relations, um, and I get the opportunity to uh, plan events for students on campus. Um, and I had this idea as we were all speaking, and we see all this amazing list of brainstorming ideas, is that uh, we can respect that students do learn in different ways. And why, instead of just saying that there's one way to um, to uh, add points to participation, why don't we offer maybe one or two or three ways at the beginning of a semester and allow students to pick the way in which they would like to participate. Um, so if one student prefers to do it, I'm uh, 
uh, I have attention attention deficit disorder, and so by doodling, that helps me stay engaged. And so I would be the type of student that would prefer to submit my notes each class. Um, you can tell um, I have high anxiety as well, so I get very southern when I speak. Uh, I'm uh, ready from Louisiana, and so I get very southern when I speak because I get very nervous. Um, although I do not sound like this on a traditional basis. Um, Sorry, I'm shaking right now. <laughs> You're doing great. Um, but other students that are more extroverted, uh, they might be more comfortable in speaking in class, and so you know that about that student, but they don't take notes, and so that's, that style doesn't work for them. And then the third option could be uh, the person that does the survey, right? Or like, they take, they don't take extensive notes like I do, but they take three bullet points, what were your highlights of the class. Um, and so that adds more work, right, on, um, us as staff and professionals to uh, assess people in those three different ways. That's a lot of work. It's like, crap, I can't remember. Does Amber, is she the talker or is she the note taker? It's annoying because you have to keep track of it all, but um, that's why there's Excel, right? Spreadsheets, right? Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, not making it one way, you know, and like meeting students where they are. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop. <laughs> you did great. That's a great comment. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I've also found just a difference, obviously, with um, with what what level we're teaching, and you know, you find especially for the first years, there's such a big leap coming from high school to the college classroom of, of what's expected of them and their own kind of active participation in their learning, and so just having that grace period to for them to really cultivate what does it mean and what and what they you know their potential in that kind of participation and. Um, um, and I know there's some students who do have tremendous anxiety and then kind of um, deciphering whether there's just that kind of discomfort and needing to push your boundaries a bit and kind of finding solutions for the ones that do have, you know, real s tremendous anxiety. And um, sometimes we come up with solutions where they, where they email me, you know, some sort of questions or summation of the readings that I can then present to the class or something like that. But I feel like that, that level and the grace period for, especially for first years is really is really important. So I want to follow up on that, but there was another hand. So thanks again. Uh, this has really been great. It's given me a really good perspective and open mind to a lot of things. So I teach here in the School of Communication, and one of the challenges that we have is that a lot of our students are going to, they're going to be required to communicate in a variety of settings, oftentimes in a group setting going forward. So one of the things we try to teach people is to learn how to communicate in those settings because you're going to have to do that throughout your career. So for example, you talked about attendance. I don't consider attendance participation. I consider attendance as if you're showing up for your job. Okay? Sure. And just showing up for the job doesn't mean you're going to get paid. You actually have to do something once you end up showing up. So that's why and I'm one of the people that actually have a high level of uh, participation grade and overall grade. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I don't think you know, maybe even lowering that a little bit. But a lot of the class is discussion. For example, we'll look at different case studies and talk about how companies manage that process. They manage their communication process during that. And if people are just sitting there and not talking, you know, it doesn't really make for a very interesting class. So that's why we're trying to encourage more participation. Sure. And I think that. You know, the, depending on what the learning objectives are for your class is definitely going to affect what it is that you choose. Absolutely. Definitely. Right. It always goes back to the learning objectives and the kind of things of what you're trying to teach. One more hand back here, and then I just want to follow up with something. Thanks. Um, you mentioned having uh, uh, your learning objective, objectives inform kind of how you're using participation. But I also think if you're going to assess it and assign a grade to it, you should be teaching what you expect or what you think good participation is. So students don't necessarily have that those skills. And so if that's your objective, you need to give them the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one more comment back here in the back. Thank you. Actually, I have two comments. Um, but I'll make them quick. <laughs> uh, the first one was in uh, the a session earlier today, the speaker said, what gets graded gets done. And I've been trying to think of how to incorporate that into class participation in the discussion. It seems 
maybe having various ways of showing that you've read the paper or you've read the chapter, and, and that counts as class participation. And the other thing was, I was the one who brought up attendance, and I said it in a sort of tentative way, I know, <laughs> but we, I teach English as a second language classes, and many of them are very shy about speaking. And coming to class and paying attention, nodding, I do sometimes accept that as class participation. Coming 100%, they get a maybe 10% for class, an A for class participation, even if they don't say much during the course. It's still a listening exercise, and that's one of your learning objectives. So it does depend. I also want those who had in their syllabus language email me if you're going to miss class. I really wonder, um, uh, I have to be honest. So on my syllabus it says do not email me if you're going to miss class. Because I literally, I, I was, I'm going to write a book which is called Dear Prof. <laughs> and I'm going to make a lot of money because I have these, I keep these emails of all the reasons why the student can't do the assignment or come to class. And I had 27 of them one semester. And I put in a Word document. I showed them to my niece and nephew who were in college. And my niece said 90% of them are lies. That's what she said. <laughs> and so I thought, what am I teaching these students? I don't think 90% are lying. But I did find out from the student who was an A student who had me write her a recommendation. And we were very close. I found out inadvertently she let slip that she lied earlier about why she was missing class. So you, you can't just make an impression and say, oh, I know these, I know my students, you know. So uh, what I realized was I was teaching them to learn how to be good liars. And I didn't want to contribute to that. And what about the student who's a first generation student who doesn't know that that's the game and that's how it's played. So I'm penalizing them and I'm actually reinforcing hierarchies of power that I don't want to be reinforcing. So I re recommend that you literally, you take the reverse position, which is this, that you do not use any email they send you as an excuse. That doesn't mean that the co communication breaks down between the two of you, but don't take it you know, for what it's worth because there is, we have found that first generation students will not come to your office hours. There's studies that say it, unless you require it or you, you know, very specifically say, you could say, but I, you know, I give everything. Anyhow, I'm off topic. What I want to do is go to my handout, which is to talk about what, since most of us, use, so the answer to this is, every, and you can all take a photo of this at the end to decide. Um, the answer is no. You can't have all of these on here, and it wouldn't make sense. But the question is, what makes sense for you? And what are you going to do based on your philosophy of education, the kind of your learning objectives, and your course content? What makes sense to you to count as class participation? So just take a moment and write. This is not the broader reflection. This is what counts as class participation based on the brainstorming we just did. What do you want to include? Okay, even if you're not done, I want to draw us back together. I want to put your attention to the, the handout that I spent quite a bit of time writing. <laughs> Thank you. So these, what I spent the most time on was the strategies for inclusive class discussion. Notice that's separate as a piece of participation. So I've already gone through a couple of these, one, two, and four. I want to um, draw your attention to number seven. Uh, six and seven, five, six, and seven go together. Uh, a whole bunch of these go together there. But surround your questions with silence. That's ten seconds. Feels like an eternity. It's okay. It actually will help people think through ideas and you get much better ideas. I always, whenever I ask a question, I always say, ask people to just take a few moments and jot down their ideas before. And it really evens out the participation so it's not the same people raising their hands all the time. Okay? 
I do much more, uh, you know, I, I've, um, I do much more turn to the person next to you. It's not a full-fledged think, ink, think, pair, and share, but just turn to the person next to you and, and discuss the question. And then um, I did that, and, and or um, if you are asking a question and no one answers, this isn't on the handout, ask them, why is that question so hard? That's not mine, that's from a teaching uh, conference I went to. And I told that to a PhD student who was teaching world politics and SIS, and he said, it was amazing, the students did, what they said is, they said, well, I didn't understand this terminology, why is he using a term like this? And, what? and then they just, the entire class, they then all talked. And he, had, he mistakenly thought they hadn't done the reading. But no, they just didn't understand or they thought they didn't understand it. So there are ways in which we make assumptions. So holding small group discussions, what I am now doing more and more is 9C, which is that I ask each group to have a recorder. I then have the groups, I, in the middle of class, I shoot out a, a link to a Google Doc. And the recorder then posts their, their group discussion. Then we all take a moment and read the different class discussion comments, and then someone will pull out an interesting idea from that. It's way more productive in terms of class discussion than if uh, we each group then reported back. And again, it's the same kind of people who usually do the comp class make the comments. Marcy. So does that mean every single student has a laptop open in front of them? No, just the five students or six students in that group. Oh, yes. And then I went, yes, and then everyone will have a laptop open. Now, is that making any assumptions? Such as? Like everybody has a laptop that they're using in class? So they can look on with the person next to them. Uh, what I do tell my students is that in terms of inclusivity, that since we refer to the texts so much, and so much of it's on Blackboard, and I don't expect them to print them all out, I leave the policy of laptops up, laptops down. Oh, okay, that to me is very useful to know. That's and so that's, yeah, I do, um, that's another workshop. But yeah, so I do that as far as, what that means is, the, the studies show that, that taking your notes by hand actually sh shows that you absorb more information and you're not just being a stenographer. And so it's better learning. And I explained that to my students. And then I was like, but so I, and you can't ban laptops in the computer because then you're outing the student who has an accommodation. So my policy is if you find that you're, um, but I also know that some students need a laptop for learning, and I say, you just fill out a contract with me that says I will only use this laptop for the purpose of taking notes, and otherwise I lose this right. And so it doesn't have, so that I will have several, but not everybody, because everybody else sort of knows. I said, if you can't stop yourself from multitasking, don't do it. That was a question that I really, I had too. Can you, so when do you have them do the contract? I, Sorry, no, it's at, the, it's at the beginning of the semester. You can ask me. I, if you email me, uh, I can just send you the language and in my syllabus. But yeah, it's very. It's just at the beginning of the semester. I said, just give me a piece of paper. They rip it out of their notebooks. They sign it. I sign it. And then I throw it away. And I just m note in the roster that they've got a laptop copy. But I, ha I used to say, uh, because I do think laptops get in the way of learning, they get in the way of participation and inclusivity, which is it's the distracted student who's checked out. And I know this from a student who came up to me once and said about the girl in the back who's, you think that she's participating, but she's really doing Sudoku. <laughs> he said it like that, and I was like, okay, this is clearly getting in the way of their learning, not just the student next to them. So that's when I, anyhow. All right, so can I just move on though? But I just think this idea of then everybody having the notes from the small group, uh, I, I just recommend that you try it and see. But again, it's also what your learning objective is for that day. And any uh, questions about the other, I just, um, the main thing is I also recommend that you pull the students aside privately if they're speaking 
too often or too little and encourage them. I do think that giving the students a chance to write before asking them to speak will change the dynamic. I've seen it in my classroom. It changes the dynamic, and it's not the same uh, few people who are speaking. And you have to grab that from the very beginning. And my students do the reading. You do my reading and not your reading, sorry. Because they know that they are being held accountable for it. All right. So, uh, and finally, I'm just going to say five ways to communicate your expectations to the students is on there. I think it's really important to model, to praise, to be gentle with corrections. And the way that I explain that to students is I respect your comments in the classroom. And everything that everybody says is worthy of taking notes. And that's a sign of respect. So if, you, if someone says something that isn't quite right, I need to correct that record as a sign of respect to everybody. It's disrespectful for me to let that slide. And so what that means sometimes is I'm going to have to say to people, that's not quite right. Or uh, as I phrased it there, you know, I can see how you would think that, but let's think some more. Right? So... And then I always just say, you know, did you hear what Mark said? Did you get that? Well, then you need to ask Mark to repeat it. What this does is it creates more of a conversation amongst the students and takes me out of it. And it makes it much more inclusive. Anything you want to add there on that? Um, again, just to put the disability hat back on, um, it's really important if you have students that have accommodations or if you have students that maybe don't have accommodations but come to talk with you about issues that they have, to really try to think broadly about how you're going to assess the student, what you're trying to assess, and how you're going to assess the student. Um, so my friend in the back here, you know, students coming, students attending class, that works for you because having listening input is part of your learning objectives. For someone else, though, that's, that's not going to work. So it's really very, very highly personalized to you, but also personalized to the student as, as you can. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to bring up something um, that just a note because it came up in my class. Like sometimes, you know, you, you say, okay, people don't like to talk in class and maybe blackboard discussion, like writing, but that's still blackboard is still an area where people can be excluded, and so that happened in, in a class that I taught last semester. Somebody, the topic was like, you know, uh, policing, racial profiling, etc., and so the black or black students in the class, they spoke about, you know, that they integrated lived experience and only one student, even though it was mandatory for people to respond, only one student responded to one. And so I just think that, and I had to bring it up, you know, back into class. Because, so I think in all of these ways, it's kind of really important to realize that even with this, like particularly around like race and, you know, uh, social status, people can still be excluded. And if we don't take advantage of what happened or what didn't happen, you keep losing the same people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Who else would make like to make a few more comments? So, we knew that there were a lot of people here, and we're going. Ninety-seven people signed up for this workshop. I was like, that is the most people I've ever had sign up, but about sixty showed up. So. That is amazing. So we were like, okay, how do we make this participatory when we know that it's going to be a large group? One of the ways you might have noticed is that we asked you for information in advance to then and create it. It was and it is more work for us, right? To share thank you to Sherry for collecting that data to put the syllabus language out there for you then to have to use. But there are so we were trying to think, how can we think more broadly other than just um, you know, interaction. We thought about small groups, but 
that's the, the, the purpose really is dependent on your learning objectives, your course content, and so what we'd like to do is to end by asking you to again just take three minutes and write, which is what syllabus language or what, what ideas do you want to make sure that you incorporate in your class participation for this year or next? So, if you, so on the website for the Ann Farron Conference, you go to number 308, and under, and on 30, I'm sorry, on 308, there are seven documents there. Okay. Not the handout that I just did, because I decided I didn't want to spread that uh, electronically. I wanted it just, it's just something I just wrote, and I want to tweak. So if you have any feedback for that, I want to... I also, um, so yes, there's seven documents there, uh, many of the ones we refer to here. There's a lot of good quality stuff there, I have to say. I felt really proud of what we had put up there because sometimes, yeah, so, so do take the time to go there. But take a moment now and just think, reflect. Look at, if you have your laptop, if you have a laptop with you, you can open up, look at your syllabus language and say, oh, I gotta change this, or oh, that looks good. Interrupt. I have two books to draw to your attention. I have PDF the chapter from this book by Herman and Nilsson, which is called Create, Creating Engaging Discussions, Strategies for Avoiding Crickets in Any Size Classroom and Online. Cricket, crickets refers to the sort of like silence that you face when you ask a question. And it actually, it goes back to the assessment question, because how you assess class participation really depends on what your class participation is, right? So we could, so that is, um, so there's a really good chapter from that book that's on our the website there. The other one is, I want, I encourage people to think about speaking in class other than just one big classroom discussion where you ask one big broad question. And this is a book by Gail Taylor Rice, which is called Hitting Pause. 36 lecture breaks to refresh and reinforce learning. And it has a lot of great ideas of different exercises you can do uh, that are very different from a big class discussion. And if you don't, on, on our uh, site is a handout I wrote, which is called 10 Active Learning Exercises to Complement a Lecture. So that's already up there, if at least you got 10. You don't have to buy the book for 65. <laughs>
the uh, information on the books is on that resource page, also on the website. So thank you very much, everybody, and wish you a very wonderful semester.